Thank you. The gentleman's time has ended, and I will uh, uh, take the opportunity to question now and appreciate the panel for being here. Uh, this is an open hearing uh, with a great opportunity. I would quickly add that uh, I appreciate the fact of having a rural, uh, rural mail carrier uh, that uh, services uh, my home uh, and uh, services is not only with the mail, but uh, in many human ways that uh, add, uh, add, I think, some, some real special um, uh, additional uh, effects to what a mail carrier can do. And I appreciate the work that is involved there. I also have a daughter who lives in a third world country and works there. And I know for a fact that her mother and I are unable to send her mail with any of, anything of value in it, knowing that it probably won't reach her. We don't worry about that in the United States. So I applaud you for that, and I, I thank you for the service that, that you provide. But we also have to understand that uh, we've got to make it work for the taxpayer, too. And I appreciate the efforts, and uh, that is why these hearings are being undertaken. I received a letter just recently from a constituent in my district uh, that operates a family-owned mail transportation business and employs 45 people in doing that, uh, that business. His business performs services at a fraction of the cost of UP USPS employees, and this tentative contract, which insources 600 highway contract routes, could negatively impact upon uh, his small business. Uh, Mr. Miller, as you rightfully stated in your testimony, using contractors helps lower the USPS costs. Uh, can you quantify how much contracting saves USPS overall and explain how the tentative agreement with the APWU that insources at least 4,000 jobs will help attain fiscal responsibility? Mr. Chairman, I would be glad to do that in writing. I have a, those numbers on the top of my head. Um, on the second part of your question, <clears throat> there was some give and take in this agreement. We gave a few things the unions, the APW wanted. We took things, and they took some things that we asked for. Um, as I think the Postmaster General has described this morning, and if not, we will send you some additional information. The unions have to compete for this insourced work. They have to demonstrate that it, they will provide it at at least the same cost that we could go outside and get it. I think it is very important that we be able to. That is the same cost at this point in time, but not the same dynamically. It could be contracted for at, some, at whatever point that yeah. it might be. But the concern that as we look at the budget, dynamically in the future, that that indeed can be a low cost put in now, right. taking these jobs away uh, with, without the incentive in the future because of the contracting situation we have. Mr. Chairman, you are absolutely right, and, and we have to be very careful the way we execute that, uh, that provision. But you put your finger on something, and that is the importance of our being able to continue contracting out and contracting out in some areas where the service is now provided by postal employees. This is a way of our lowering cost and keeping a restraint on labor, uh, wage, and benefit demands. And um, I will come back to a point that in response to uh, Congressman Micah's uh, raising about um, the sale of assets and about relocation, et cetera. We have been very troubled. The Postmaster General, the previous Postmaster General, uh, the Board of Governors, by the propensity of Congress to put riders on appropriations preventing our doing these things. And that is one reason we haven't done as much as we might have. And if there could be a moratorium, it is like a moratorium on uh, earmarks, there could be a moratorium on these riders, I think we could move more swiftly and more effectively and efficiently and the areas that Mr. Mike, uh, Congressman Mike identified and the, and the area that you are identifying, that is contracting out. Well, that is certainly worth looking at and part of the process. But let me, let me uh, just jump here quickly in the few remaining seconds. Uh, we have talked about contracts. Well, what would a good contract look like to you, Mr. Miller? And then I would want to jump over to Mr. Donahue. Donahue. Uh, a contract would be one in which uh, the service provided would be at least as good as what we are accustomed to having and the price would be lower than what we are paying now. Mr. Donahoe. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have 30,000 contracts in the United States Postal Service. So we contract everything from uh, using FedEx's planes, where they're the largest uh, uh, customer, uh, all the way down to a number of mom and pop contracts like you talked about. We take every one of those contracts very seriously. What we looked at in this negotiation with the APW as far as bringing some work back in was our ability to absorb work into the existing framework. The flexibility that we got in truck schedules allows us to schedule people in a much different way than we had in the past. We used to schedule five days a week, eight hours a day. The new schedules give us a lot more flexibility. I can absorb in the eight-hour time frame smaller contracts with HCR and saves me bottom line money without adding, adding on any people at the same time absorbing those costs. That is what we have looked at. We have, we have em, embraced process management in this organization across the board, and we have, we have rooted out numerous costs and identified these opportunities, and that is what we pursue. The other thing that is important, we did not give up any ability to outsource. As a matter of fact, the APWU has asked that they are able to compete on a, on a same basis with uh, any outsourcing going forward, and I welcome Mr. Guffey to come in with those proposals. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Donahoe. Thank you. My time has expired. We will move on uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and again, I thank the witnesses for your help. You know, the, uh, the Postal Service uh, goes into every American business and every American home uh, six days a week. And uh, I think if there was any illustration of the value of of having a, a public system, having uh, the current postal system. It occurred on and after September 11th. Uh, most people know I have a, a, an extraordinary number of people in my family that work for the Postal Service. My aunts and cousins, my uncles, my mom, my two sisters who are still there. My mom is a retiree. Uh, but uh, going back to September 11th, which was the day I was elected in the primary, uh, and, and after that, we had attacks on the Postal Service, uh, anthrax attacks. And uh, down here at the Brentwood facility, we lost uh, two brave uh, postal workers from in inhalation of anthrax. And I remember uh, talking to some of the local union leaders uh, with, with the American postal workers and the letter carriers and my mail, ha mail handlers and supervisors and the postmasters. And they were very concerned about going to work because in many of these uh, facilities, many of these plants, uh, you had the risk of anthrax. And so the question was posed to the union leadership at the APWU and National Association of Letter Carriers and the mail handlers. They said, should we send our people into work? Should we send them into work when we know that there is, especially with the Brentwood example, there is lethal danger there? And uh, it was a very precarious time because we in government were afraid that uh, if the mail did not get delivered uh, to every American home and business, that the economy would seize up. This is when President Bush was saying, get out there and, and, and try to, uh, you know, stimulate the economy. Well, if, if the American postal worker had not gone to work, uh, it would have seized up our, our economy. And I think it was a very proud moment that the union leaders at the Postal Service uh, asked their, their members to go into work. And I know my, my sisters had, my, one of my sisters had two young kids at the time, and I know that was a vexing uh, situation for, for the union leadership and, and the workers themselves. But God bless them that they went to work and, and they kept the mail being delivered and, and we got through that tough spot. But with all this talk of you know, privatization. I wonder what, how that would have gone if those were private employees for some contractor. Do they make the same commitment to, uh, to deliver the mails in a, in a tough situation? Do they handle the security and the special responsibility that they have with respect to our, our, our nation, as do the postal employees? And I think it is remarkable, as, as one of my colleagues noted, that for the sixth consecutive year, uh, postal workers are again uh, rated, I think it is the Pew poll, the Pew uh, uh, Foundation does a polling on, on uh, the, the popularity or the, the reliability of Federal employees and uh, all employees. 
in regard to the American people. And they, they continue to rate the postal workers uh, the highest, six years in a row. But uh, we're, we're talking today, at least in one part, about um, going to five-day delivery. And uh, I'm wondering if, if that's just one way of uh, if, if the Postal Service isn't going to deliver on, on Saturday, then who is? And I think there will be a private entity that will want to take, take up that space. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Donahoe, you have, you have any thoughts on that about uh, losing market share for the Post Office by, by considering going to five-day delivery? Well, thank you, uh, first, uh, Congressman Lynch, about the excellent comments about our employees. They do a great job. We are very proud of them. And uh, even this winter, up, up your way, that mail got through every day in really trying conditions. Um, the Saturday issue is, a, is, a, is an issue we have wrestled around with, um, and it has been a concern. The, the big concern we have is that there is a changing marketplace, and the first class volume that we have lost over the last few years has really pressed us in terms of revenue per delivery. And that is why we have looked at making these changes. Uh, the one thing we would do uh, in this process would keep our post offices open so you could still come in and buy stamps. If you needed to get mail, we will have post office boxes open. We will be able to do that. And, of course, we would still be delivering things like express mail. Um, as we examine the, the, the demand for, uh, for mail going forward, uh, it does uh, press us on some of those choices. We have looked at things like asking the American public to move their mailbox. We have done some surveys in that area. People say they don't want that. We have talked about changing service standards to save us some money there. Uh, we have got some feedback there that that wouldn't work. And, of course, we hear about the post offices. So um, it is an ongoing process. Uh, we, would, we, we continue to look at that. But as we have laid out in our a comprehensive plan. We think that uh, just the, the nature of the changing demand for mail uh, would force us to move uh, to a five-day delivery schedule. Thank you. I see my time has expired. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Ross of Florida, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, gentlemen, I thank you all for being here. You know, I take very seriously, as you all do, the issue of the prefunding of the health care and the pension. And, and assuming that we are able to address that, uh, because I believe it is something that we need to address. Uh, Mr. Donahue, it doesn't necessarily, though, resolve the, the long-term issues of the United States Postal Service, does it? No, it doesn't. I mean, we still have to make some systemic changes. Absolutely. We still have to address workers' compensation. We have to address that, absolutely. Overcapacity. And we are doing un that. Underperforming facilities yep. and labor costs. Yep. So while we are able to and I identify that there is a big issue out there. The bigger issue is really the systemic changes we need to make to the Postal Service for right. the long term viability. And that is what we have laid out in our comprehensive plan. And this agreement with the APWU from one union helps us to get in that, uh, in that direction. Now, you and I have been able to, to meet several times, and I appreciate not only you and your staff for the cooperation you have given me and my understanding for my subcommittee. Um, responsibilities. We discussed a pay for, for, pay for performance plan that has been in existence for about 10 years yeah. with, with, with managers and supervisors, I guess, about 65,000 of them. Could you just briefly describe the, the, how that has worked? We, we have established a pay for performance plan, the Postal Service. To your point, we have 65,000 people. That is postmasters, that is supervisors, that is administrative people, all of the non bargaining employees in that. What we do yearly is set goals. We have got national goals on service, on finances and on people, a balanced scorecard, and we also have individual goals at a unit level. We have constructed a process that all 65,000 people have an individual rating, and that is how they are compensated. It is a strictly a pay-for-performance system. We have no COLA. We have no step increase. All of our managers in this organization are compensated on pay for performance. And, and what has your been, been in your experience with those managers? Do they I, like I, it? They like it. It is competitive. They, they are on that website all the time seeing how they do, and it, is, it has produced tremendously good benefits for the Postal Service and, more importantly, for our customers. Now, translating that mindset to the collective bargaining negotiations that you have, has this type of pay for performance ever been introduced or discussed in a collective bargaining situation? We, we Mr. Guffey and I have had some discussions, and, and, and we talked about, you know, what to uh, going forward in that area. Ms. The, the changes that we have been able to affect with this negotiation are the most we have ever seen. The fact that we have been able to, to change uh, flexibility 
and long-term pay structure indicates that there is a willingness uh, for the APW to really uh, take into effect our customers and our business but, going but, forward. But never was, was, was put on the bargaining table a pay for performance plan, was there? Well, we, we had some discussions. <laughs> but, but like some of the other things, it is a give and take, and I certainly And, and I, Mr. I, Guffey, I, I mean, you mentioned in your remarks that, of course, if the economy were to get better, then that would change things. But in fact, uh, it is much more than the economy. I mean, if it were just the economy uh, always being the driving force, we may still be riding around on horse-drawn carriages or having mail delivered by bicycles. But it really has to do with market changes, with technology. And is it not true, then, that in order to adapt, the United States Postal Service and its employees have to adapt to changing trends in the market, not only the Internet, but technology as a whole? It is true that uh, there are some Americans who will never use the Postal Service again, but they are not required to pay for it because the Postal Service does not receive one dime of taxpayer money. It is everything, the benefits, the wages, the buildings, everything is paid for by postage. And while the market, there's individuals in the market who will use the Postal Service. But it's more than just the economy. In 2006, we had a good economy, and yet first class mail started declining significantly. But so we could rebound from the decline in first class mail if we weren't, didn't have the $5 billion uh, and, weight and, put and, upon and, the Postal and, Service. But it's more than that. I mean, let's, let's be honest. It's a lot more than that. And, and let me ask you this now. Uh, how do you feel about this agreement? We're both going to be honest? <laughs> Sir? I'm going to try. I will ask the questions. Okay. Thank you. Now, how do you feel about this agreement? I feel like the agreement was a give and take. I think the, the agreement, we uh, gave some flexibility in exchange for the uh, security of our people for various things. A lot of talk has been talk about the no layoff clause. And you told your employees it is a pretty good deal, didn't you? I have told my people exactly what it is. And you think it is an excellent deal, so much so that you are going to pay your members to vote, are you not? I'm not paying anybody to. You're vote. not paying your members. Have you looked at your website, where it says to encourage participation in the contract ratification process? APW President Cliff Guffey is encouraging locals to get out the vote. I do. The National Union will reward the locals that are most successful in mobilizing members to vote, with the top three locals in each of several categories receiving monetary compensation to be used on behalf of the local members. So you are buying their vote, are you not? They can vote no. And if if every one of them votes no, they addition, vote no. In addition to buying their vote, are you not also using it as a uh, membership? Sir, I, I'm, that's an affront to say I am buying people's votes. I, just, I, I, just I realize that is common practice on your side of the table, but it is not with mine. Does your website not offer compensation to vote? It offers people to encourage people to vote. Thank it offers the, encourages the locals to vote, not one way or the other. The Chair would suggest that neither side get into rationale behind somebody's intention, uh, and I would expect that on both sides of this, uh, this debate, and I appreciate that it, uh, you're both very uh, interested in getting it right. But uh, I would make that caution. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman, uh, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank all of the witnesses for being here with us. These are obviously difficult and complex issues and serious problems. I have always been told that there are no simple solutions to complex problems. Uh, Governor Giuliana, do I understand and did I understand you to suggest that if we did not have to prefund the retiree benefits for the Postal Service, if they did not have to prefund those benefits, and although we thought we were putting in some good provisions in the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, um, that instead of a deficit, we would be talking about profits in terms of the Postal Service? My statement was over the last four years that would be true, Congressman. What would be the downsides to not having that requirement? If, if that requirement was not present, I what don't, would? I don't believe there is any downside. We are funding on an annual basis to the excess of $2 billion health care benefits for our employees. We commit to, we have been paying them, we continue to pay for them. Private corporations do not have to pre fund 
retiree health care benefits. They have to account for them on their balance sheet. It is not a cash output. And in fact, because that is such a burden, in 1992, I may not have the year right, but in the early 90s, there is an accounting rule change that said companies had the option, a one-time option, to cap forever retiree health care benefits. Because if they couldn't do that, if they didn't do that, they would have an unbounded liability on their balance sheets, and there would be no way to be able to tell whether they were going, a going concern. Most corporations in this country took that option and capped them in 1992. And whether you retired in 1980, 2000, or 2040, the company has no more responsibility for those health care benefits than what the cap was in 1992. And while this would obviously not solve the problem in terms of our long range conditions, but it would be movement and we would not be standing still. We it, would be moving. It would be significant progress. We have made progress with the $3.8 billion in this union negotiation, $5.4 billion, $5 billion payment per year would make a significant progress. We also need to move forward with 6 to 5. We also need to stop overpaying for FERS. These are the drivers. There's lots of changes that need to be made. They're all comprehended in our plan. We've considered all these things. We've offered what we believe to be the most rational choices. We don't want to have to do six to five, but considering all the alternatives, when we polled the American people, when we took our surveys, when we had outside experts look at that, they said out of all the alternatives, raising prices, uh, changing delivery standards, um, and, and a whole bunch of others, this was the least painful. This is the best we could do. Mr. Donahoe and Mr. Garfe, let me commend both of you on the tentative contract that has been negotiated. I think that it is one of the most positive labor management movements that I have seen in a long time. And I know that there are efforts on the parts of some people in our country to diminish the role of unions who have fear, but it seems to me that you struck an accord that suggested that both sides understood that it was not a win-lose situation, but it is a win-win situation for the American public. And I think that is where we have to go. So how would both of you comment briefly relative to being able to reach that agreement? You want to go first? Just real quickly, I think uh, American labor and, and, and industry has to come together and work together to bring back industry and, and commerce to this country. And I hope this is a step to show other people that it can happen. I, uh, I would agree with uh, Mr. Guffey. We have great employees in this organization, and they want to do a great job for the American public. And I think that as we sat down and talked through uh, things that we needed from a Postal Service perspective for flexibility and, and uh, cost benefits going forward, we were able to achieve that. And Mr. Guffey was able to achieve what he needed for his employees, and it was a win-win. And it, was, uh, it, it is a very good thing for the American public and our customers. I commend you both and uh, yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. DeJarley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I would like to just take a few minutes and, and maybe put some things in perspective. Um, you know, we are facing a tough battle this week on the budget, and uh, certainly the country right now is hurting in many ways, and, and people are scrambling to uh, cover themselves and, and make sure that uh, financially they can be as stable as possible. Uh, you know, we go back to districts with high unemployments, 9 percent across the country. Several counties in my district are upward to 20 percent. And, uh, you know, times are certainly tough, and I sympathize with everyone. Uh, according to committee calculations, the average employee cost for USPS is 89845 per year, or close, close to $45 per hour in benefits. 
Um, is the total compensation averaging out more than $80,000 per post employee per year, including wages and all benefits, including uh, retire health benefits, Mr. Donahoe? Yes, I would have to double check those numbers, and I would get back with you on that. But uh, all our, the way we calculate our costs, it is wages and full benefits, including retirement. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, if that is true, then the average work hour uh, for a USPS employee that is publicly reported is about $40 per hour? We consider a fully loaded hour right around there, yes. Okay. Um, do you think that is generally a fair amount in terms of trying to keep uh, the Postal Service running when you are doing these negotiations, talking to employees? Nobody wants to give up anything. It is hard to take things away from people once they have them. But uh, is, is that as low as people are willing to go to keep their jobs? I think that, uh, again, uh, to the point we have been making, when we went into this negotiation, our goal, three goals, we were looking for immediate financial relief, we were looking for flexibility, and we were looking for long-term structural change, and we achieved those. Uh, we have got a substantial change in the way that we will be compensating non-career employees, and that pulls that loaded factor down significant by 53 percent. The other thing, of course, is the 10 percent differential going forward. That also will pull those down. We realize the labor costs are high, and, and as we have worked with the, the APWU, they understand where we were coming from. The other thing that is important is we also have real opportunity with the flexibility that we have negotiated in there, so that if you have a full-time employee, they can now work between 30 and 48 hours a week, which is very different than we have had in the past. So, Doctor, we are looking at every possible way to provide great service in an, efi an efficient and effective way. Okay. Can you uh, speak just briefly to the graph that is uh, behind us here, the private sector versus sure. I, I can see that. I, it would be interesting to see the numbers, but it almost looks like uh, the blue line starts going up when we were, began to prefund employee health benefits. Um, that is the first thing that I see. Um, we have been very it is it's critical to understand that the Postal Service has focused not only on, on total labor costs in terms of wages, but we have focused on headcount. We have reduced headcount in this organization by 30 percent since the year 2000. That is legacy costs. Thank you. Mr. Yep. Gu Mr. Guffey, uh, when I go back home and talk to my folks, you, uh, it has been mentioned that the Postal Service doesn't cost the taxpayer a dime. What uh, What is going to happen if you default on September 30th? Who does that burden shift to? Uh, I believe uh, Mr. Miller said it would be a miracle uh, uh, for these things to happen. And, you know, uh, I think Congress can work together and resolve the problems of our country and the Post Office. And I, and I think that is what America wants you to do right now. Uh, I think they want their post offices in rural uh, Tennessee. I think they, they want to have their uh, mail delivered. I, I think they want this sort of thing. Uh, well, as I said, Jack, you, you had mentioned earlier that you <coughs> employ 100 plus thousand veterans, uh, which I think is great. <coughs> That's fantastic. Uh, what do we say to the active military personnel whose wages are, are far less than what we're talking about here in the forty dollars per hour? Well, I'm not sure if you take the weighted average of about the uh, the military uh, benefits that are involved with their retirement and their. Uh, and their uh, uh, health benefits were, were all provided by the government, too. If you put it all together, I am not sure their package would not be the same. Uh, I am just saying that, yes, we would like to have a good jobs for these people to have when they do come home. Talking about uh, the custodial jobs, uh, they were maybe priced a little higher than they should be, but they were jobs that were reserved for the veterans so the veterans yeah. could come home to these good jobs. Well, when you are talking about concerns about your employees <coughs> losing their pensions and their benefits, uh, what do we say to the private sector who faces losing Social Security and Medicare benefits? Well, I think they only face the losing of Social Security and Medicare because of the economy and that our jobs, like say hundreds of thousands of jobs are now overseas, trillions and trillions of dollars of American money is overseas right now as opposed to being working in this economy and lifting up this, this next generation to they pay and you broaden your tax base so you can afford Social Security and Medicare for these people. That is the real problem in this country right now, not the fact that public workers are making too much. It's you don't the think the is, government spends too much? You don't I, think there is ways? There is a lot of things I think that the government spends money that they shouldn't be spending on. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, this hearing is costing more right now uh, uh, in tax dollars than what uh, the Postal Service is getting out of tax dollars this yeah, year. And that is a big part of the problem, and that is what we are here to solve. <laughs> 
I thank the gentleman. The Chair would note that the graph that was on the screen does not include the prefunding. That is uh, okay. that's a pay-as-you-go uh, cost. And uh, I appreciate the gentleman who, by the way, I think we are both on salary. So I am pretty sure that we, whether we show up here for a hearing or not, the cost is substantially the same. The Chair now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. I thank the Chair for that. And I thank all the members of our panel. First, let me say that I think that the way that you collaboratively work towards a tentative agreement is to be commended. I think that is what the collective bargaining process is all about. And it seems to me, from listening to your testimony and reading it here today, that everybody made concessions. Uh, which correct. is, in, in essence, uh, what the American people expect out of uh, public service employees and employers when they, uh, they go to these negotiations. They want everybody to be reasonable. And I also seem to think that there would look to be downsides for both of you if you decided to push the button and go on to arbitration. And I think that uh, was a trigger to getting things done here. So I, I think that that is at least a positive that we can take out of this. And knowing that there were constraints seen by management, on the, the, what they perceived to be some legal constraints. and. I think the union is under, uh, obviously under constraints of not wanting to risk going to arbitration and coming down with far less than what you got. But I want to talk about, I will leave to the, uh, the testimony that was already given and the questions asked about the pension and retirement contributions and how much that would go towards solving the issue that you have here. When we had a hearing back on April 15 uh, of 2010, uh, John Potter, who was then the, uh, the, the Postmaster General, was one of our witnesses on that. And I asked him, uh, a little bit about the privatization and what would be the cost uh, to the uh, American citizens if the thing was privatized. And, and he talked, and I am going to uh, just synopsis a little bit here. He talked about the fact that it is fair to expect that you wouldn't get mail necessarily delivered to your doorstep. Prices, uh, in all likelihood, would significantly go up, uh, that not all areas would, in fact, be served. These would all be uh, so universal service would be threatened. So these would all be decisions that management could then make on that. I then wondered whether or not there wasn't some price tag that what we got in terms of universal service and a large retail distribution situation and six-day mail and all of those things that we get for having this type of service as opposed to a privatized service, if somebody hadn't put a value to that. And Mr. Potter said we put a price tag on that of about $4 billion. Uh, and then he said a smaller, now in today's dollars it is like, like $4.5 billion on that basis. Do you gentlemen agree with that? That is the, uh, when the Postal Service was for, first formed back in the early 70s, there was a universal service option that uh, we could have asked for um, continued appropriation to actually cover our universal service. And, and if you look forward uh, with the uh, value of money going up or, or, or with, through inflation, it would turn out to be about that amount. Well, you know, I, I wondered why we hadn't gone forward, but Mr. Potter then said that, um, that the, uh, they ended up in very poor condition in the late 60s because of the difficulty in getting the appropriations that, and they were reluctant to ask for it. That's, uh, 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 our issue has always been one of a self-sustaining entity. If the government does not pass the budget this week, the mail will still get delivered. We have been self-sustaining. What we have been asking for is for Congress to act on these mandates around the pre-funding requirements, the six to five day and the first. As I have said before, we get those resolved. We, we, we know that we will be a, a viable, ongoing business. We still provide excellent service for the American public. That is the help we need from Congress. Yeah. So, you, know, you look at it another way, though. It is like people, I think people by and large, want the services they are getting, the universal service, the six-day mail, and all those things on that basis. So you have a customer out there that owes you about $4.5 billion a year that you are not collecting. I don't know what kind of a business decision, a management decision that is. Mr. Guffey, do you have a comment on that? Well, it would be nice to, uh, and refreshing to see that the money was coming from the government to the Post Service instead of just from the Post Service to the government. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Donahue, you are smiling at that, but I mean, you, you do have a customer out there that we that we've put a value of $4.5 billion in the services that you rendered to them without ever collecting a dollar for it. Well, uh, the reason I am smiling is because we have some other bills that have been owed over the years and sometimes they don't get paid. So we. <laughs> We, like, we would like the Congress to feel that the Postal Service can stand on its own and do a great job for the American public without any kind of appropriation. Well, that is what we are asking for. Okay. All right. so I, I guess and no all taxpayer money. So if you look at it as an appropriation or you can look at it as paying value for what you are getting in return. So you have decided, I guess, that it is not worth the political hassle to ask you know, the American people to pay $4.5 billion a year for the service they are getting 
it's much easier to try to run starting with $4.5 billion in the hole uh, and try to build around that. Here is the thing. We have paid into the retiree health benefits $43 billion. What we would love Congress to do is to take a look and see that that $43 billion, along with what the Chairman mentioned, our ongoing payments, we think in, when you go ahead with a 400,000-person Postal Service going forward, we are already covered with that. So we don't want any money. We want no taxpayer money. We just want Congress to remove that burden that we are being forced to pay. First, I owe $6.9 billion, or uh, you owe $6.9 billion back to me in first overpayments. I got a bill last week from the OPM increasing my premiums. I mean, I am already overpaying. Just give us what, treat us fairly. We will do a good job for you. Well, I already co-sponsored that bill, so let's see what we can do with the rest of them. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Brawley. I assume you are referring to Mr. Braley, Mr. Chairman? I am sorry. I apologize. No, I, know, no, I know better. No need to apologize. Uh, I am one of those people who thinks in order to know where you are going, you have to know where you have come from. And I think it is interesting to note that on July 26 of 1775, the Second Continental Congress appointed Benjamin Franklin as the Postmaster General at an annual salary of a whopping $1,000. Mr. Donahoe, I am sure a lot of colonists thought that he was grossly overpaid for that work, but we all know how important it was in the evolution of this country. In 1808, the Select Committee on Post Office and Post Roads was established by the House of Representatives and it was the beginning of a surface transportation program that has benefited this country ever since. One of my wife's uh, grandfathers was a first-generation American whose father came from Germany, and he left to go back to fight the Kaiser in World War I, the, the world to end all wars, came back and became a letter carrier in Dubuque, Iowa, and became president of his letter carrier's local. And when they started renovating the White House under the Truman administration. The people he worked with thought so much of him, they spent the whopping sum of $2 to get some of the timber from the White House to make a gavel for him that I am fortunate to have in my possession. When my father left the small rural community in Iowa that he lived in to go to Iwo Jima at the age of 18, he got letters from his mother that I am thrilled to have in my possession that only got to him halfway around the world because of the hard work and efforts of men and women in the Postal Service and Postal Delivery System. That is why I love letter carriers and postal workers. My dad came back and became a substitute rural letter carrier. And I know from growing up in a small town that that postal delivery service was often a lifeline that got you much needed services that you needed to do your work and to function in society. But I am very impressed with the fact, as the ranking member of the Veterans Affairs Economic Development Committee, that unlike many Federal agencies, the Postal Service has done an extraordinary job of employing veterans. And you brought this up in your testimony, Mr. Guffey. And here at a time when returning Iraq and Afghanistan veterans have an alarming unemployment rate of 22 percent, I am trying to figure out why my friends on the other side of the aisle want to add to our unemployment problem by firing veterans, by firing women, and firing minorities who make up a large percentage of the Postal Service workforce. That is a question we all need to be concerned about. Some of my colleagues have, har have argued that a union would never lay off a hardworking veteran postal worker. We know that is not true. We know that it happens because that is the way the Postal Service has had to make tough decisions. We also know that if we are going to file, fire middle class American veterans that work for the Post Office, it is not going to fix our budget crisis. And that is why we have to fix this problem with prefunding because we know that it is the low hanging fruit. It is the most clear obvious opportunity we have to make an impact, and that is what we should be focused on. According to two independent offices in an OIG report, the Civil Service Re Retirement Service is overfunded by 50 to $75 billion, and the Post Office's FERS program is overfunded by $6.9 billion. We should let the Post Office transfer that budget surplus to fund their future health care obligations and make sure at the same time that we are doing everything to promote efficiency. And, Mr. Dono, I remember when my daughter graduated from high school five years ago, 
And I was thrilled to find out that I could get customized stamps of her and her friends to give them as graduation gifts that they were thrilled to receive. So we know there has been a lot of innovation going on at the Postal Service to try to address these market pressures, to modernize and to come up with new revenue streams. Can you give us some examples of what other things the Postal Service is looking at, like that stamp program? Sure, I would like to. Um, one of the things that we have been focusing on uh, from a revenue perspective is, is, is simplicity and making sure that we uh, can really grow the business-to-consumer uh, channel, especially for small business. So we have just introduced a new product out there called Every Door Direct. And the idea is that in a very simple way, if you are a small business, you can reach uh, within a couple zip codes everybody that lives there. We are also conducting Grow Your Business Days right now at thousands of post offices across the country all summer long, teaching people how to use eBay, Amazon to grow their small business. Um, Congressman Micah showed me before uh, his, he got that email on his BlackBerry. Uh, one of the products we are working on right now is the opportunity to, to show you what is coming in your mailbox today. We have that technology. We have that as a product going forward. So we know that we can do things for small business. We can also do things for people who like to have a little bit of digital in their products, too. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Micah. Well, first of all, Mr. Guffey, uh, I would have to take great exception with you. Your comments on this is some sort of assault on the labor, whether it is in Wisconsin or in uh, or this hearing. Um, Mr. Mr. Guffey, do you know that what the financial differences between the States and the Federal Government is? Uh, the, the, big, the big difference, and there is not a whole, whole lot of difference, the uh, American it's, taxpayers pay the cost for both. Yeah, and, but the, and, the, the and, big and you have to have em taxpayers employed to make the, pay the taxes so the payroll true. can be done. That is true. And we have spent the last uh, several years paying people not to work, rewarding failure and penalizing success. And we have been great keeping the unemployment up about 10 percent. Uh, um, not to mention other areas that are 20 and 30 percent. Uh, the big difference is that um, the Federal Government, we just keep printing the money. If you go out the door here and go down the end and go out on Independence, you can almost hear those, those presses going day and night printing funny money. Uh, we have indebted this country $5.3 trillion in, what, 24, 30 months. Uh, we are borrowing. So, so the big difference is that the States have to have a balanced budget. We are printing the money. Okay? So the States, you call this an assault on labor, but they are making the tough decisions dealing with their biggest cost factor, which is their employee base. And it is not pleasant for anybody. Um, so uh, this is not a hearing that is intended to uh, do an assault on labor. Do you know how much we we're, are we're borrowing for every dollar we are spending, Mr. Guffey? Uh, way too much. The economy should be here. It is about 42 to 43 cents per yeah. dollar we are borrowing, most of it from foreign sources. This is not an assault on labor. <laughs> you know, um, I'm in the transportation area, um, we used to have Kept, we kept firemen on trains, even though we didn't use coal or anything. We had to fire for many years. We had conductors and cabooses, even though we had adopted uh, electronic means of communicating with the, 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 the train workmen. Um, you are aware that it wasn't an assault on labor when we had to eliminate some of those positions. Would, would you say that was an assault on labor? Well, when you use 70-year-old examples, I don't think that I can't relate to some of those 70-year-old well, examples. Well, again, okay, let's use a modern example. Uh, they're telling me they can run the post office with 400,000 people, and I, I have 572,000. I've got to make some changes. Is it just make work? I mean, more and more is going over this. They're even going to this. When they go to this, they'll need 
fewer than, than the 400,000. You can order your medicines over that, but you cannot get them delivered to your home. Well, they're, they're, that's the, true. the mail volume is going to change. True. The type of mail is going to change. That's true, and that's why I usually use FedEx or UPS. But, uh, and uh, this is no, uh, this is no uh, front. I, I love postal people. I, George Coleman was my, postma, my postman for 17 years. Uh, he went on to be the mayor of DeBerry. Uh, my postman who came to our home in upstate New York wrote me a, uh, a birthday card till the, 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 the year he died. I can't think of people I like better than some of the postal people, uh, workers I know. We try. But this is not an assault on them. This is a change in the whole dynamics of uh, communication and, and our society. And uh, it, we've stopped feeding. We can't feed dinosaurs. We can't afford to do that. So again, I, I, and again, Ben Franklin, you know, was the postmaster in 1775, appointed by In 1775, it was interesting, Ben actually arranged to have mail delivered from Philadelphia to New York in same-day service. Did you know that? Uh, yes, but he did, it, he did it as the King's uh, representing postmaster, not as the United States postmaster. Yes, I know, but he could, he could still do it, and uh, even though he had the position, I think his son had the position, they could uh, deliver the mail in with same-day service, which we still can't do today uh, in the United States. But what you have to do is adapt, and the post office is uh, becoming a dinosaur and will soon be extinct if it doesn't uh, adapt. And we are working very hard to adapt with the post office. The money source. tree in the backyard died, and um, we have got to find a better way to, to, uh, to deal with uh, a $6 billion and your $15 billion credit limit or whatever it is is uh, about to run out, and there is no more coming from here. Thank you. I, yield I thank the gentleman. Yield back. We now go to the gentleman, Mr. Yarmuth, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. And I am glad that Mr. Micah brought up UPS and FedEx. I have a very special interest in this hearing because I ha happen to represent the district, which is the home of the global hub of UPS, and UPS is our largest single employer. Uh, and I am also an honorary member of the Letter Carriers Union and very proud of that. So I have multiple interests. And Mr. Micah said he likes to rely on UPS and, and FedEx, and I'm glad he relies on UPS. But I went back and checked, and the, the least you can spend to mail anything or deliver anything with UPS is $5.17, and the lowest price you can deliver any, that FedEx will deliver anything for is $7.22. Uh, Mr. Donahue, what do you think would be the impact on American business, charities, local governments, utility companies, and so forth, if for every piece of mail they had to send out, it would cost $5.17? We wouldn't be talking about one day fewer delivery. <laughs> we'd be probably talking one day a week. It would be dramatic. Now, we're very proud of the fact that we have been able to hold our uh, postage rates down at uh, 44 cents. And we are also very proud of the fact that we provide excellent package services for businesses, too. Uh, we work well with FedEx and UPS. We deliver a lot of their packages. This relates to the question that Mr. Tierney asked a while, while back, and, and he talked about the $4 billion-plus subsidy, essentially, that goes to users of the, the Postal Service. How would you break down the users of the Postal Service? What percentage of them are commercial enterprises? Which percentage of them would be private individuals sending individual personal correspondence? It is probably close to um, 95 percent of the, of the mail that comes into the system is mailed by a commercial entity. The uh, uh, customer business, to, to the, uh, the, the mail that goes between uh, residences today is a lot smaller. Uh, you know what, let me take that back. It is probably 90 percent because there is about uh, 10 percent of, of, of customers still uh, use the Postal Service to pay their bills. So me paying a bill or me sending you a card, that represents about 10 percent of the volume. So essentially what we are talking about here, whether it is $6 billion or $3 billion or whatever, it amounts to a year, forgetting the, the argument about FERS and, and the prepayment of retirement benefits, we are talking about an enormous subsidy to American business. Um, I would not say it in, in, in those terms, because I think that 
the American customers enjoy getting what is in their mailbox. It is a great way for people to advertise. It is a great way for people to correspond, even if it is just to say, hey, check my website out. We feel that the Postal Service is very important uh, for the American economy, the bill payment side, bill presentment. Um, so it, it is it's a, it's an excellent platform for all users in this country. I, I don't disagree at all about the, those statements, but the fact remains that if all of those businesses who were sending advertising, and I was in the advertising business as a publisher at one point, also took advantage of uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the break given to publications. Uh, but they are, they are sending those advertisements, those solicitations, and their billing, see, their billing uh, uh, mailings as well at a rate that would be is far lower than they could get anywhere in the private sector in a free market uh, situation. Um, yes, but again, what we have been asking for in terms of the, uh, the, the mandates that Congress has, has, has got with us on the retiree health benefits, um, we think that there is a resolution around you those with, without having any effect. On our customers. I understand. What, well, you could continue. Do... You could continue, continue to offer that very low rate, right. and I'm I'm right. very proud of that. I'm, yeah. I'm don't want my time to expire. Okay. I mean, we when we talk about you know the great Republican Lincoln said the legitimate role of government is to do for the people what they can't do for themselves, and essentially I extend that to mean the private sector can't do, and the private sector can't deliver a piece of mail for 44 cents across the country, across around the globe. Probably not. Probably not. One question, Mr. Quickly, Mr. Guffey, on the on the issue of retirement benefits, and this has disturbed me a great deal. When, in light of what's happened in Wisconsin and and Ohio and in Indiana, the the uh, the notion that somehow these are overly generous benefits when we are hiring, asking police officers, firefighters, mail carriers, and the like to embark upon a career which requires a great deal of physical uh, exertion, and to have basically a shortened career as opposed to something they might, el they, they might otherwise do. And part of the trade-off, part of the way you get people to embark upon those jobs is to uh, guarantee that there is a healthy retirement for them. Otherwise, you would have police officers, if it weren't a healthy retirement, police officers at 75 years old chasing criminals and 75-year-olds delivering the mail and 80-year-olds uh, climbing into buildings. I mean, isn't that part of the consideration here? in order to get people to do these, some of these public service jobs or quasi-public service jobs in your case? I think that's a, I think the, uh, uh, that is a, a great consideration, but there is also a pride and uh, knowledge of serving the, uh, uh, America. Uh, you know, I am from that era of uh, John F. Kennedy, you know, to see what you can do for your country. I went to Vietnam. I tried to uh, serve the country in the uh, Postal Service. And, uh, Retirement. My retirement, I take home like sixteen hundred dollars a month, and out of that, and, and I pay my health insurance three hundred dollars, or about two fifty, something like that, out of uh, my own health insurance, my part of the payment. So it's it's not a huge retirement when, when by any means, uh, but it's it's a satisfactory life of uh, serving your country and your fellow Americans. Uh, thank you for that answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the younger of two near-identical twins here and present today, I tell you apart mostly by your ties, both of which are stunning, but your father, uh, I think, won by edged you out a little on the ties. Mr. Clay. Thank you so much. I will have to catch up with him on my haberdashery. Uh, let me applaud uh, Mr. Guffey for the comprehensive and thoughtful testimony you submitted to this committee. Uh, for today's hearing. I think it shows the serious commitment uh, that the APWU has to work in partnership uh, with the U.S. Postal Service uh, to address the challenges of the, uh, that it currently faces. And uh, I, I stand firmly in support uh, with, with working with our families uh, in the postal unions, and I am committed uh, to supporting the Postal Service's reorganization to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. Uh, however, I am very concerned with some of the elements of this hearing. Uh, this Congress in 1970, uh, through the Postal Reform Act, took action 
uh, in essence, to take politics out of the Postal Service and also gave workers collective bargaining rights. I am afraid that some here today are seeking to return politics back to the Postal Service and per perhaps strip those rights. Uh, this committee certainly has a welcomed responsibility uh, to perform oversight duties for the Postal Service, and I don't think anyone would question that. I think many here, like you, want to see the Postal Service succeed. Uh, the service that USPS so admirably and consistently provides personifies the best of, of America. Uh, what is disturbing is that some want to use this hearing to attack something else that best per personifies uh, um, America, workers' rights and the freedom that comes with collective bargaining. I hope I am wrong and I hope that we are here today uh, to help the Postal Service and its workers find the right path to sustainability and success. I don't think that involves getting in the middle of the collective bargaining process, and I don't see how that helps. Uh, Mr. Guffey, your testimony demonstrates quite clearly that the Postal Service labor force has made some remarkable gains in productivity in the last few, few, few years. In fact, the workforce has been reduced by close to 120,000 employees since 2008 to 572,000 employees. This represents a 27 percent reduction since 2000. Total costs have also been reduced by $11 billion since 2009, including a reduction of $4 billion in labor costs. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Don Donahue, you also mentioned in your written statement that the Post Office has achieved record service and productivity levels in recent years. Is that right? Yes, sir. And yet on the wage side of the equation, Mr. Guffey, you testified that since 1970 there has been only a fairly modest increase in straight time wages uh, in real terms. Do you agree yes, with that? That's correct. And, Mr. Donahue, you, do, do you agree with that analysis? Yes, our employees have done a great job from a productivity standpoint, and, and they have enjoyed raises that have tracked fairly close to the, to the uh, rate of inflation. And wouldn't you say that the Postal Service has gotten a pretty good deal out yeah. of their employees over the years? I think the American public has gotten a, a, a very good deal from the Postal Service and the employees. They are very dedicated. They have done a great job from a standpoint of productivity and service. I thank you. I thank you both for your response. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, I, th I thank the gentleman. And uh, uh, I certainly think that uh, you do have to keep pace on the haberdashery side. You know, you, you have a haberdashery history with President Truman. And, you know, and, and that alone as a Missourian is critical. <laughs> yeah, we, we do have something in common. We are from the same state. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you. We now recognize the gentleman from Vermont for five minutes, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, the witnesses for their excellent testimony. Uh, my view, this is a practical problem to be solved. I don't see that we should be coming at this uh, trying to take away uh, wages and benefits, uh, and I don't see that it should be uh, attacked by trying to take away uh, uh, delivery services that Americans have, have really come to rely on. Uh, I'm from a rural state uh, in Vermont, and I don't know how the letters. Uh, we had a lot of snow this year. I mean, we had a lot of snow this year. We had <laughs> we had 10 feet of snow. In fact, it's snowing now. And uh, somehow, some way, on my eight-mile dirt road, you managed to deliver the mail. So I don't know who's responsible for that, uh, but uh, it wasn't you guys. I can tell that. <laughs> it was. It was those. 
those people in, in, uh, in these little post offices back in Heartland, Vermont, Norwich, Vermont, uh, it is quite astonishing. So uh, there has been a, I don't know, festive atmosphere here uh, talking about what is good and bad, but the bottom line is the mail is getting delivered. The other thing that is quite amazing is you are doing it on these snow days for $0.44, cents, uh, a first class piece of mail. That is a pretty good deal. And uh, it is business and it is uh, uh, those personal letters that, that uh, we don't get as many of, but we all love to receive. And uh, the other thing that is amazing, and I think it's just got to be acknowledged, it gets sort of swept aside when we get in these discussions, is that the things that the commercial uh, deliverers don't want to uh, provide to, to deliver, uh, you guys do. And I, a lot of times it's frustrating when we go to our mailbox and there's more quote junk in there than we want. But it is a part of commercial life in this country. So. I think those have to be uh, acknowledged when we are trying to wrestle with this problem. The other thing, you pointed out that you have had about a 30 percent head count, uh, 100,000 fewer employees since 2008. Um, you know, Governor Miller, that is an amazing thing. You know, we sit up here on these dais and act as though it is time to change because uh, it is a new era, and, uh, and it is true that we have to change, but that is hard. I mean, these are livelihoods people have built. Uh, their lives around a system that we put in place in a way that made sense, and then not just individual employees, but businesses, uh, homeowners. Uh, I mean, I think that is a significant accomplishment that uh, demonstrates real good faith. I mean, what are your views on that? I agree with you. I agree with you, Congressman. It is a remarkable achievement. It is uh, something that has been done in a compassionate way. Most yeah. of it has been done in term, uh, done by attrition. Uh, some have been reassigned, uh, but um, it's a remarkable achievement. At, uh, the unfortunate thing is that the volume of mail has contracted faster when you consider the productivity increases than we've been able to keep up with. Right, and that's that's the new world that we're in. So further adjustments have to be made. But my sense here is that no one's easing off on the gas pedal and trying to make these changes. Is, I mean, would you agree with that? Yes, sir, I would. And I think uh, uh, Postmaster General Donahoe has done a great job. He was, he was in charge of this uh, as Deputy yeah. Postmaster General. And I am sure that Governor Giuliano or Chairman Giuliano would agree with that and might have something to add. Well, thanks. No, that is all right. Let me go on to another one. You know, one of the, the issues here is do we go to a five-day delivery to save money? And I understand there is some debate about how much, quote, money that we would save. But let me ask this question. I uh, will ask you, Mr. Donahue. What would be the impact on losing market share to uh, your competitors if we went to a five-day week? We, uh, FedEx and UPS don't deliver on Saturday now, um, so we don't think that there would be much of a change. Um, we think that, uh, again, uh, customers have the opportunity, if they would like with the Post Service, to have a post office box to get their mail in, and we still would be offering express mail service. So uh, Saturday is our lightest day. It is the day that, that, that from, a, from an advertising mail standpoint, that is the, the lightest day of the week where advertisers try to hit a mailbox because generally people are out and about on Saturday. Monday through Friday they come home, they look at their mail, and then they do their shopping on the weekend. Uh, Mr. Guffey, how about you? What is your sense on that? I know that on Saturday I have more time on my hands. Uh, and I, I mean, the Saturday delivery is something I, I hate to see. I, any, like. I hate to see any service cut to, to the American people unless it is absolutely necessary. Uh, there are other means of uh, it would create, uh, you know, a situation where private companies, mailbox, et cetera, and these places that provide their own boxes would not receive the mail, uh, which is good for us because then the people who have those would have to come get post off boxes if they wanted them on Saturday. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, d I hate to see any services cut to the American people uh, when, when there's opportunities to uh, keep providing those services. Okay. And Chairman Giuliano, you have been talking, as we all have, about the first uh, uh, over overpayment of contribution, right? Correct. I mean, this is an amazing situation. You can be over aggressive or too passive, and it seems like uh, we're making uh, you front money uh, beyond what actuarially, by any standard, should be required. Is that more or less the case? That's my understanding. That's and, and Congressman, there's a pattern behind this. This is not new. In 2003, it was determined that CSRS was overfunded. 
by, I can't remember the number of words, but over $50 billion. So what is the problem of changing that? We are told by, by OMB and Treasury that it takes a change in the law. And that is it? Well, so, Mr. Chairman, we can, we can help solve this problem. We change that law. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and, uh, and I trust that uh, in the President's budget, somewhere hidden, I, I didn't see it, he had, he had considered that. But I, like I say, I missed that. We will now see the gentlelady from New York for five minutes. Ms. Thank you very much. And I would like to ask the Postmaster General, Mr. Donahue, questions on the wage rates in, in comparison to competitors. And I know that some of your private uh, sector competitors are nonunion, but it is also my understanding that the wage rates of the Postal Service are roughly equivalent to the private sector uh, competitors. And as the Postal Magazine study showed that Postal Service letter carriers start at $15.85 an hour, while the starting pay for a UPS driver and a FedEx carrier are roughly $16 and $14, respectively. And I would like to uh, ask you, uh, does the fact that the USPS is required by statute to deliver universal service and to do a six-day-a-week drive-up, that their compensation costs put them possibly at a competitive disadvantage? But actually, compared to the Postal Magazine, you are very competitive. In fact, you are lower uh, than, than one of your major competitors. So I would like your comments on that, Mr. Donahue. Yes, uh, th thank you, uh, Congresswoman Maloney. We we um, we do realize um, that we uh, have a competitive uh, rate of pay, and that's something very important to us. Uh, as we've sat down and negotiated with the APWU, uh, the key thing for us was to uh, achieve some short-term uh, financial benefit from the contract as well as, some, as increased flexibility and some workforce structure going forward, and we were able to, to do those. Labor costs do drive costs in this organization because we are such a labor-intensive organization. I think that we have worked very well with this union to come up with some good solutions going forward to, to reduce costs and help keep the Postal Service viable for the American public. Thank you. And, and as uh, the majority has pointed out repeatedly, 80 percent of the Postal Service's operating costs are related to workforce uh, compensation. But just so that we are clear on this point, I am informed that less than two-thirds of that 80 percent is for compensation of the Postal Service's unionized workforce. Is that correct? That is true. So the unionized workforce of the Postal Service accounts for roughly 50 percent of the operating costs, not 80 percent as some would imply. Is that correct? As in, in any business, you are going to have wages. We have got uh, wages that generally wages and benefits make up about 70, uh, 70 percent of our costs. We have another 10 percent of our costs, roughly 9.1 percent. We pre-fund retiree health benefits. The other 20 percent cover transportation, supply services, fuel, like any other company. Well, I, I think that it is important that we are clear about the actual labor costs represented by the unionized workforce. Uh, and that, and you have helped us do that. And I'd like to open it up to the other members of the panel to comment on this issue, if you would, please. Clearly, our our bargaining unit only represents about thirty percent of the cost. Twenty nine, I think, about twenty nine percent of the cost. Mm -hmm. Other comments, Congressman Maloney. I would uh, just comment that uh, we think that the percentage of cost is not the issue. It is how the total cost relates to our financial position. We think that today's uh, tentative agreement that we are talking about makes good steps to reducing those labor costs in a fair way while, out, well, while maintaining flexibility and using that workforce. And, and Governor Miller? Mm -hmm. uh, Congresswoman, I think, number one, we have to look at every opportunity for the Postal Service to reduce cost, given our dire financial straits. Uh, secondly, I would think that it would be, frankly, whether we were in dire financial straits or not, it would be irresponsible for us not to look at cost at every opportunity for a contract negotiation. Well, my time has expired. Thank you very much. I thank the gentlelady, and uh, we will now go into a second round.
double check to make sure that no one else came in. Okay. Uh, I want to tidy up a few things. The gentlelady from New York uh, talked about unionized workforce. Mr. Donahoe, it doesn't matter whether your labor is unionized or not, does it? If it's 80 percent, it's 80 percent, right? It's, it is. It represents 70 percent of our total cost, yes, sir. The okay. Other, the, other not, the other 10 percent is in the retiree health benefit cost. Right. Well, but she actually said unionized workforce, which confused me a little, because you have plenty of nonunion workers. Yes because they are management and they are represented by associations. Yes, sir. Uh, secondly, I think there was a lot of dialogue back and forth, and I want to set one thing clear from the center of the dais. This is not about the hardworking men and women of the Post Office. This hearing is not even about the union negotiations per se. Our committee's primary jurisdiction in the area of concern is, is the Post Office right-sized? for the future. And one of our concerns, one of my concerns, goes to this, and, and uh, uh, Governor Miller, maybe you can help me with this. In the union negotiation, they negotiated a no layoff. Now, the problem is, if we go from six days to five days, and you, you score savings of 60,000 workers, and you can't lay off workers, how do you get the savings? Well, um, Mr. Chairman, first, um, the no layoff provision was an extension of the previous contract. No, I understand, but just narrowly, you can't score a savings if you can't get rid of the people, especially when you already have 100,000 too many today. I have asked my staff to look at right. a lot of areas that we may legislate, which would include, and uh, uh, for the Postmaster General, I, I know you are looking for legislation. I have got to tell you, we, what we probably need to do is bite the bullet one time and figure out how we are going to retire people that are over 55 and have over 20 years of service to help get your number down. Voluntary departures aren't working. The fact is you have less than 1 percent, or slightly more than 1 percent. You have the lowest attrition. Any private company would love to have the attrition you have. Basically, I mean, you still have two people that are 98 years old on, on the payroll. I mean, you, people don't retire, do they, Mr. Donahoe? They, they, they do retire, uh, Mr. Chairman. We have, no we, have, we, have, we have reduced the headcount in this organization by about 215,000 since the year. But, but today you are carrying over 100,000, almost 200,000 more people than you would need if you started the organization. No, wait a second. Let me, hear me out. If you started the organization to do the job that you currently need to do, you built the facilities you needed, and you hire the workforce you needed, you would need between 170 and 200,000 less people. You are shaking your head no. Governor Miller, you if you built from the ground up, right. you would need a lot less people, wouldn't you? Right. You are right, Mr. Chairman, and, and you are right on the basic principle. But I will defend, as I understand it, I'm, uh, Pat can correct me if I am wrong, but sure. the $3.8 billion estimate includes the problems of diminishing the numbers. So under this contract, because business is contracting, you don't realize all the flexibility benefits right away. But it, your, your point is correct if you think about it, and that is if you are going to be contracting very fast, how do you bring down the number of employees as rapidly as you can? Okay. Need? Well, I have got two more things in the short time remaining. Mr. Guffey, you said you have a $1,600 retirement. Now, that is your retirement basically from your military service, right? No. That is your postal service retirement? That is my retirement? postal service retirement. Okay. Do you have any other entitlement coming now or in the future from your service to the post office? No. So that is it. Okay. It's, uh, we want to make sure we understood that. Uh, I have got a chart I want to put up very briefly, because this is the crux of one of our challenges. All of you have, have been talking about prefunding and overfunding. When you look at that chart through 2016, which is the end of the pre-funding period, it is higher and then it drops down. You all see that. I want us to understand that every year you don't pre-fund between now and 2017, you have to add it back on in the later years. So one of the challenges I am looking at is if we were to abate today all your pre-funding from now till 2017. Uh, 17, although you would drop down, in 2017 we would be looking for 9 or $10 billion and every year going up. So one of the challenges is even if we were to smooth it out, unless we were to forgive 
essentially what you are going to have to pay, essentially you are lowering it now, you are going to be raising it then. Does anyone disagree with that? Yes, uh, yeah. because that chart includes a, a track that would result in substantial overfunding of the account. Okay. Well, I am going to ask one, one exit question here. Chairman, you, uh, you talked in terms of private corporations, and you have been, you've been very good on it, so I want to hold you to it. Are you willing to do what they did in 1992, have Congress statutorily tell you that if we are not going to stand behind the pensions, whatever you pay in, you pay in? Because if, if what you are asking to do is to not prefund and you want to sort of be there where 1992 made it, those private corporations, uh, and I believe including United Airlines, who stuck the American people in their bankruptcy and others, basically they limited their, their, their contribution, and a default meant that the retirees got less. If you don't, as you call it, prefund, and then the post office continues to drop off to where it is not able to pay in the amount because it simply would be too big a burden to have post off, postal carrying make sense, wouldn't we ultimately end up with a Federal responsibility? In other words, today you are saying you don't want to, you call it prefund, we call it fully fund on our side of the aisle. If you don't pay in now and we were to say, you know what, we will give you the abatement, but we will tie it to the default being a default that doesn't pay out, how, how would the letter carriers and others feel if what we said was, you know, because you don't want to pay it in, we will do that? but then we won't stand behind it with full faith of the American people. How would they feel there? I don't know how they would feel, but let me, let me um, Oh, you know correct. how they would feel, don't you, Chairman? Well, no, yes, I know. You will hear. If you will hear, unless you say, I know they <laughs> would not like would, that. I know they would not like that. But there is there's there's some confusion here, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to straighten out in all honesty. You are referring to uh, funding pensions, fully funding pensions. Well, I'm pe referring, but, but we well, were I'm talking health care, but you used the analysis of the pensions earlier on no, 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 and no. health care. No, I, I, the 1992 date, and I may, 19, might not be the exact year, but right. close to that. But it's when the, General Motors had this huge hit one that time was, and locked that it. Was, that was, yes, yeah, right. It was a book hit. It was a balance sheet hit. It was not a cash hit. They chose to determine what the liability levels were going to be for retiree health care benefits, not pensions. Pensions are governed by a whole different set of pension accounting rules, which for most public companies only require 80 percent funding uh, based upon the actuarial needs. And that is where we're, I came up with what happened in yeah. the case of, of United Airlines and others. The, the fundamental question, my time has long expired, but the fundamental question I think that we are going to leave unanswered, but anyone can respond for the record, is isn't it true that if we don't fully fund by some way, I am not overfund, but fully yeah. fund, That's that we leave the, the taxpayers of America on the hook should the Post Office not be able to pay in the future? We are paying, we are fully funding, the Postal Service is fully funded for pensions and, overfund, and overfunded for pensions, both FERS and CSRS, and overfunded for retiree health care benefits. All we are saying is, we, as I said in my statement, we are more than willing to continue paying. Of that $7.9 billion in 2011, that is $5.5 plus $2 plus some other billion dollars that we are paying to uh, make sure that we are fully funding the retiree health care benefits on the actuarial needs. What we are what we're concerned about and what we are asking for fairness and a level playing field is the $5.5 billion that came across in the 2006 PAEA that on an accelerated basis required us to prefund. That is what nobody else has to do. We want to stand behind these responsibilities. We have been. We think we can. And I appreciate that. I, I, I apologize, but I really have exceeded my time. Mr. Cummings? Let me ask you this, Mr. Dono. You, you are not asking to eliminate prefunding, but to pay your retiree health benefits over a, uh, on a true cost basis and spread it over 30 to 40 years versus tackling the liability in 10 years. Is that accurate? What, what we are looking to do is get a true accounting of exactly what we owe. We would not shirk our responsibility. When we talk about 400,000 employees, that, that would include a postal service 
that delivers mail five days a week, that has a substantial number of non-career employees that would be not adding on to that liability, and then we could recalculate everything that we have got going forward. That is what we need to do, because until we do that, you don't really have an idea of exactly what is owed. Let me um, say this to you, Mr. Don Donahoe. Uh, I, too, join my colleagues in applauding you for, um, and I say this very, very seriously, for uh, hiring Ron Strowman. Uh, he did an outstanding job for us. I was sorry to see him leave. He helped us through our transition. He was absolutely magnificent. And um, that means a lot to us to know that he's there, and we really do appreciate that. Um, we, you know, agree. we agree with you. We are very happy to have him. The, one of the things that I wanted, you know, as I, both sides of the aisle have um, said that this is not an attack on postal employees, and that it's not. I don't want one single postal employee. I have some in my family, and I know how hard they work. Mr. Guffey, I understand, I really do understand your emotion. You don't have to apologize for that, because you are representing some people who have already given a lot. They have given a lot. I think anybody who looks at the fact that we, that 100,000 people, 100,000 people, that is a lot of people since 2008 are no longer working for the post office. That is 100,000 families. I sat, Mr. Guffey, on the Joint Economic Committee. And you know something very interesting that I have noticed is that when the employment rate is 8.8 .8 for the nation, it is 15 point something for African Americans. And the Hispanic rate is, is close behind. And then, you know, so when you tell me, Mr. Donahoe, that we have got 40 percent minorities, that is very, very significant. I want to see the unemployment rate come down also, just like all of us do. And when I hear about women, women, many of them, I am sure, single head of households, struggling every day trying to make it. Many of them have lost their jobs. I, and then I, I, you know, when we talk about these loss of jobs, I don't want it to just be like collateral damage. And then we are talking about veterans. Until I got deeply involved, in, I didn't know the post office hired this many veterans and took care of the disabled veterans and gave them some dignity instead of having them, as I see them in the AMBET Center in my district, many times unable to find jobs and whatever. All of that is very important. And, I, and it would be, I cannot walk out of this room without telling you all that I am proud of the negotiations that you have been involved in. And, and Governor Miller, I thank you for what you have said. I know you have some differing, differing opinions here and there, but you said several things. You said we are a collegial body, but you said something else that is so significant. You said, I think, I really believe that Mr. Donahoe is doing a great job. And that is what it is all about. And I, I, what I am saying to you is that sometimes, you know, one of the things I try to do with my, my kids is I try to be careful that I just don't say the negative when they do something wrong. I try to make sure I compliment them for doing something right. And, and sometimes I get a little bit upset that we don't root for the home team for the team that is doing it right. And you said something to me, this Mr. Donahoe, yesterday that I hope you don't mind me sharing. You said that if all the unions work with you like Mr. Guffey's union worked with you, we could solve all kinds of problems. And so I just, again, Mr. Guffey, the reason why I'm talking about this is because I know that there are people, you employees who are sitting there saying, you know, we're going to get 10 percent, new, new people saying, we're going to get 10 percent less. Something, I know they're sitting there saying, we're not going to get a raise for two years. They're sitting there saying, 
you know, a lot of our co com colleagues have, have already gone for whatever reasons. But I want them to know that a grateful Congress appreciates what they do every day. When I look at my mailman in the rain and snow, and although I was kidding a little bit, of, I'm serious, seeing dogs run after them, I don't know how many members of this Congress would walk up and down steps, up and down steps in the hot sun delivering mail. And, and in many instances, going through all kinds of difficult circumstances. In my neighborhood, I live in the inner city of Baltimore, you may not even find a mailbox. The, they can't even find the mailbox to put the mail in. But some kind of way they do it over and over and over and over again. They get up and they do it. And I, I think that we need to take, take a time out and applaud them for what they do. And I, I just, I, I know that public employees are catching hell from all levels and being constantly told that they're not doing this, not doing that. But the fact is that they're doing a lot of wonderful, great things. And again, I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing and may God bless you. I thank the ranking member. I'd like to thank the witnesses for their testimony. In closing, I'd, I'd like to echo uh, what the ranking member just said. This hearing has said in no uncertain terms, hardworking men and women of the Post Office, not just this particular union that we just, uh, uh, contract we talked about, but all of the workers. I think on both sides of the aisle, we've talked in terms of how do we get to a fair uh, pay-in for the various future obligations of the Post Office and, in fact, how do we get to the right number of postal workers. I think we can all be proud on both sides of the aisle. This has not been about uh, any kind of cheap shots on the post office, postal workers who have dramatically improved their productivity, whose rating by the American people continues to be high for customer satisfaction, but simply a matter of how do we get to the right number and the right recognition of obligations now and in the future to meet a mandate that this Congress has voted for and reiterated repeatedly when it came to uh, the self-sufficiency of the Post Office. The Ranking Member and I take very seriously our unique obligation to oversee the Post Office and to, in fact, bring such laws as may be necessary to incorporate that. In closing, we did talk about one particular piece of legislation. I believe that the, uh, both the Republicans and Democrats here are going to have to work on a number of pieces of legislation in order to help the Post Office control its own destiny, free up the Post Office to uh, enter markets appropriately, and most importantly, to get to the right number. I can't from the dais, and I know the ranking member would share this with me, we can't tell you what the right number to pay in is. We can't tell you whether the administration's uh, refusal to, uh, to look at FERS is appropriate or not. But this committee will hold hearings. We will get, reach out to the experts to try to find those right numbers. And if those numbers need to be adjusted, you have my assurance, and I believe you will have the assurance of every member on this committee, that we will work for those right numbers regardless of the scoring or other uh, technical uh, hurdles, because we do want the independence of the Post Office to be about you are taking responsibility for your costs and us staying out of your way. So once again, I thank you. You have had many questions unanswered. I would invite you to use the next seven days to revise and extend in any way you see fit, and they will, without objection, all be included in the record. We stand adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank Mr. You, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Thank you, Mr. Cummings.